Yeah, uh, BoostCon this year is being held in Aspen, Colorado, and uh, Boost is uh, an open source library project. Uh, basically what happened when the original C++ standard was developed back in 1998, I guess that was, wow, that was 11 years ago, man. Um, the members of the standardi standardization committee that worked on um, the standard, they weren't able to get all the wonderful features that they wanted to in. Um, you know, most of the core language features got in, but there are many interesting library components that they really wanted to get in the standard, but they just didn't have time to polish it up and they needed to get something out, you know, this decade, um, because all of these non-standard implementations were out there, you know, Microsoft, VC6 among them, and uh, it was causing a lot of pain for users, so to get that standardized was important. So that's why things like hash containers aren't in the original C++ standard. Um, and there's a very anemic auto pointer and things like that. So when that happened, um, the members of the committee, uh, some of them got together and said, you know, the next time um, we update the standard, uh, it would be really nice if we could just point to some implementation of all these library features we wanted and say, look, users have been using this stuff for, you know, five, six years. Um, they're well tested. Um, the interfaces are well understood. We've really polished them up. And we can just incorporate those interfaces wholesale into the next standard. And that'll make our work a lot easier. And we won't have to um, try to hammer this out, design it by committee, and so forth. So they start up an open source library project called Boost. Mm. And it's grown to be very popular. Um, it's basically a big collection of sub libraries that work together. So you've got some hash containers. You've got uh, smart pointers, you've got a math library, um, a graph library, things like that. Um, and many of those um, have been incorporated into the next um, standard C++ OX uh, as planned. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to Boost, uh, the BoostCon convention uh, next week, and I'm going to be presenting about um, the Parallel Patterns Library, uh, uh -huh. which is uh, done by the PCP team. Yes. Um, even though that's a separate team from the VC libraries, they're being shipped together. Um, so I've got examples of how to use that with the STL, um, and the other talk I'm giving is about um, the C++ OX features both in the li uh, language and in the library, which is uh, my own area. Mm, excellent. Well, yeah. One of the questions I would ask, since on your blog you probably talk about implementing, uh, you know, how to use these new features, mm -hmm. what was it like actually create, adding Lambdas to C++? What was that experience like? Well, that, Lambdas are a core language feature. So C++ is very unusual, as far as I can tell, um, compared to other languages. Um, although, although in this respect, it's most similar to C. Um, C and C++, they, they divide the language into two parts. They say, here's the core language, things like you know, pointers and arrays and functions and whatever. Um, and then there's a standard library that comes with the core language. And C and C++, um, for th reasons of efficiency and generality, uh, what they do is they try to keep everything out of the core language except what's needed to implement um, generic and efficient libraries. So that's why strings are not a fundamental data type in C and C++. Instead, in C you just have, you know, const care star, and in C++ you have the standard string class. Um, things like constructors and conversions uh, and copy constructors have been added to the C++ core language that support the standard string class. But the core language doesn't know anything about standard string. So lambdas, they're a core language feature. And they're actually, th there was a lot of debate within the C++ community about whether they were necessary. Um, if you look at uh, the boost libraries, um, they tried to implement lambdas, um, which, uh, which are unnamed uh, function objects that you can just conveniently define whenever you need to like if you're sorting a vector of integers, by default, it's sort, sorted by less than. So you get uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1 is less than 2, is less than 3, and so forth. Or if you're sorting strings, um, less than um, compares lexicographically. So apple is less than bear, is less than cat, Got it. and so forth. But what if you want to reverse the ordering? Um, well, then you could uh, pass a custom function object that says, no, I want to order these by greater than, or by some other comparison, like comparing the lengths of the strings. And um, lambdas are a, a technique for defining these function objects in a very convenient manner. And at first, uh, everyone tried to do it um, in the library. Uh, so boost released a boost lambda, boost bind, um, 
boost bind and uh, boost mem fund were then incorporated into TR1. Um, and they, they are very convenient. Uh, and we were uh, happy to ship them in 2008 SP1. Uh, but they also have problems. Uh, one is that you have to learn this new library syntax instead of just writing ordinary C++. And also because there's all this library machinery there, um, optimizers uh, can be defeated. Uh, they see all of these data members being stored and they don't know how to inline everything. Um, so although everyone tried to implement lambdas in libraries, eventually the shortcomings of that became clear. And that's when the committee said, you know, in the next standard we really need a core language feature to define these unnamed function objects. So lambdas are a core language feature. Uh, they were developed by, uh, they were implemented in the compiler um, by our front-end developer Jonathan Caves. Uh, and I had nothing to do with it. Uh, since I'm a library developer, um, I can use lambdas, um, although right now we don't in the standard C++ library, we just benefit. Um, but we didn't uh, implement any part of that. Whereas with other features like R value references, there is a core language component where it defines the semantics of things like trefref. And then there's the associated standard library chains, where uh, changes where vector gains things like move constructors and move assignment operators. Uh, and that's what um, PJ Plauger of Dinkumware and I have been working on, the library changes there. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Should we show you some code? Yes. Sometimes there's lots of <laughs> lambdas and R-value references. <laughs> T-ref, and, 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 and it gets a little yeah. bit confusing. So All these new words. Maybe Stefan us. might, for a simple class, right. kind of show us the move constructor and the yeah. move assignment operator. That. And, uh, excellent. Um, I, I don't remember, um, the last time I talked to you... Um, yeah, it was a while did, ago. Yeah, did I talk about the swap optimization? Swap optimization? Yeah, I love inventing new words and... That's a really good one. Yes, as far as I can tell, I was the one who invented that. You coined that one. So I'm Apparently. Just... That's what searches tell me. Great. Now you're in frame nicely. Okay. 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 Um, and so in VC9, we had this idea of, say you've got a vector, vector event. Okay. And so this thing, let's call it, you know, uh, V. I need more space here. Here's V. And it contains a bunch of elements, and each of these elements is a vector like this. So you could use this to implement a, a ragged matrix where the rows are different lengths, or you know, a square matrix, a rectangular matrix, uh, where the rows are all the same length. It doesn't really matter. So this could be, you know, four, five, six, one, two, three, uh, four, five, and there's nothing wrong with this. It's perfectly valid. It's wonderful to use in C++. But what happens when you start pushing back uh, additional uh, vectors into your uh, matrix? Well, eventually we're going to run out of space. Um, there's a certain number of elements here. This is V size. And it has capacity to store a few more elements. So if you push back a couple more vectors, we can store the vector objects in this remaining space here, and then they have these dynamically allocated buffers, and everything's good. But what happens when we run out of capacity? Well, then we need to reallocate. So then this vector needs to get a new memory block that's even bigger, lots and lots of elements, and it needs to move this stuff over from the old memory block. So it would copy this first element. This would be V of zero, it needs to copy this subvector over to the new memory block. So we've got to allocate a new chunk of memory, put four, five, six here, and then do the same for the next vector, the subvector, and so forth. And then once we've copied everything over, then we can free all these individual guys. So we're calling Windows Heap Free. Uh, and then we can free our old memory block, and now we have lots more space to go push back more elements. The problem is we had to do a bunch of copying there, and that can be inefficient. So in uh, VC8 and VC9, we had this optimization that said, oh, when you've got a vector of STL containers, and uh, a vector of vector is the simplest example, then when we're reallocating, when we push back more elements, instead of doing all of this copying, let me undo some of this, there's our old one, Here's our new one. We've got all these subvectors here. Say here's four, five, six. Instead of copying this memory block over and then eventually freeing this, 
That's kind of silly. Instead, we can